I'm going to start off with this uh, picture of myself, and uh, <laughs> it asks the question, uh, what is it like to be a scientist? Now, actually, every day I get up, and I really enjoy science. It's a great privilege to be a scientist. So you might be thinking, well, why the grumpy face? And the reason why is this, is around the world, many uh, universities make scientists feel like this polar bear, and I'm not complaining about the heating in the buildings. What they will do, for example, is they'll take a physicist, put them in a physics department, and expect them to stay there. So although they can see all of these great departments out there on the horizon, there's no meaningful way to collaborate with them. And this idea is infiltrated through society Oops. to the extent that it's actually got a, no, uh, a name. It's called the art-science divide. This idea that you're either from the arts or the sciences, but you can't be both. Now, I know uh, from personal experience that that's not true. I have a degree from the arts and I have a degree from the sciences, and I bet many of you are talented at more than one thing. So why shouldn't you be allowed to do more than, more than one thing? And in fact, I've never heard anybody say, wow, the art-science divide, what a great idea. <laughs> nobody likes it. So you might be thinking, well, if nobody likes it, why is it here and where did it come from? Oops. No, many people cite this book uh, from the 1950s. And the author, C.P. Snow, certainly writes a lot about the art-science divide. But he actually wrote the book as a sort of warning shot. What he said is that society is evolving so quickly that if we're not careful, our march towards specialization will create this artificial divide. But it's not natural, and it's certainly not inevitable, so it can be defeated. I remember traveling as a tourist to uh, a town in Brazil called Manaus, where two huge rivers come together. And as a tourist, you can catch a boat right to the confluence. And you can look down and see all of this amazing activity in the water. And I remember thinking, it's right at the interface where all of the cool stuff happens. Now, if you think about it, the arts and sciences are like two huge rivers. So how do you get them to flow into each other? And the answer is actually quite simple. All that you've got to do is find a common gravity. You've got to find something that both people from the arts and science find interesting. And that's why, from an early age, I started to think about nature's patterns, because surely everybody is interested in nature. So let's have a look at a few examples. Uh, this one is actually quite a mundane example. This is a zoom in on the surface of an old dried out potato. Now, I'm always amazed at how sort of visually striking something so mundane can be. Uh, but there is more, whoops, take a look at this. These are the neurons on the right hand side of your brain. So this is a circuitry that allows you to think. Now, I don't know about you, but are you, are you worried about how similar your brain looks to this old dried out potato? <laughs> it, it explains quite a lot actually in my life, but if, if you leave that worry aside for a moment, what it demonstrates is a greater principle, which is that you can take these natural patterns from quite diverse systems, and they look similar. And the reason why, they look, why many nature's patterns look similar is because many of them feature branches. So for example, rivers have lots of branches in them, uh, lightning has lots of branches in them, and of course trees, as we can see back here, have lots of branches in them. So my career has gravitated towards something which is called bioinspiration, which is this idea that you can learn from nature's patterns and then take what you learn and apply it to an artificial situation. It turns out that this principle is really useful in many different research disciplines. And I've been very lucky at the U of O because they've given me positions in physics, psychology, and art. And uh, we get on really well. The only thing that they don't like about me is my hair. If you look carefully, they've actually photoshopped my hair out. <laughs> but it, it's still here, as you can see. Uh, 
So this is our campus, and what I want to do is take you on sort of some of the brief interdisciplinary journeys that I've been on to see if we can learn something from them. I want to start off with this example. This is a physics-chemistry collaboration where we're building tiny little branched patterns out of metal. And what we want to do is put them in solar panels. Now, of course, solar panels are great news because they collect all of this solar energy for free. The only problem is that today's traditional designs don't convert that energy very efficiently into electricity. So you might be thinking, well, where's the problem? Well, for one thing, have you ever wondered why these solar panels have to be shaped the way that they are? Because uh, nature's great solar collectors, trees, aren't shaped like that. They're branched, and because they're branched, all of that huge surface area collects lots of this energy. So what we want to do is, based on that, is that we want to incorporate these little branch patterns into solar uh, devices to improve their efficiency, to put on rooftops. We also want to put them in these little electronic chips. And the idea is that in the future, we'll then hand those chips onto a surgeon, and they'll put them in the back of uh, people's eyes. Now you think, well, wow, where did that come from? <laughs> and it's a great question. This thing called the retina in the back of your eye is actually just like a natural solar panel. It receives light, converts it into an electrical signal, that then gets passed onto the brain so that you can see. The problem is, is that each year around the globe, millions of people get diseases of the retina, and that wipes out your natural solar panels and causes people to go blind. Every seven minutes, someone goes blind. So what we want to do is replace those damaged natural solar panels with our artificial ones. And the only problem is that we have to interface them with the nerves in your eye so that they can pass the signal to the brain. And no great surprise, because these nerves are natural, they're branched. So what we're doing is growing these artificial versions so that they can speak to the nerves and pass the signals on. So we're de developing all these ideas for the human eye, but also for artificial vision as well. Because just look at this cool little guy here. Probably your grandchildren will have these things as sort of their friends or maybe as their servants. <laughs> Whatever you're going to be doing with these robots, these robots are going to be having to see. And so we need to actually develop uh, artificial vision. So I think you can sense, based on just these few ideas, that the idea of bio-inspiration has a really bright future in the sciences. What I want to do is switch gears and ask the same thing in the arts. And I want you to consider this famous American artist from the 1950s called Jackson Pollock. Now, as you can see, he had a really unusual style. He actually poured paint directly onto the canvas surface. The amazing thing is that using that unusual style, he generated patterns where the paintings today are the most expansive in the world. Each of his paintings are valued anywhere up to $600 million each. What we've done is develop computer programs that can analyze the patterns so we, we can compare his painted branch patterns to the natural branch patterns that occur, for example, in forests. And what our computers have shown is that they're exactly the same. Now, this is great news because in addition to all the real Pollocks out there, there are lots of fakes where people are trying to convince you that they're real things so they can collect $600 million. And that turns out to be quite a problem. So the great news, though, is that when we analyze the fakes, those fakes can't replicate the natural patterns as well as the real Pollocks. So our computers can distinguish the reals from the fakes. That saves museums millions and millions of dollars by not purchasing fakes. And it also project, uh, sort of protects the legacy of this great American artist. When you look at a real Jackson Pollock, you really do know that it's authentic. Now, you might be saying, well, how did Pollock manage to paint these natural patterns so well? Well, when you look at his unusual style, presumably it's something to do with his body motions. So in a collaboration with uh, human physiology, we're looking at people's motions while they, paint, while they kind of are uh, painting. And I think that this is a great example of how to defeat the art-science divide, because on the one hand, 
the data is telling us something about the art of this great painter. And at exactly the same time, the data is telling us something about the science of human motion. Now, because literally the multi-million dollar question is why do people spend so much money on his paintings? Why do they like them so much? Is it that these natural branch patterns have some sort of special magic aesthetic quality to them? So to that, answer that question, we've been collaborating with psychologists and investigate how people respond when they look at these natural patterns. And this example here is called an eye tracking apparatus where you, you put the image up on a computer screen and then a little camera underneath monitors your eyes so that you, we can see where the people have been looking. So this red trajectory is where your eye has been looking. It turns out that your eye is incredibly efficient at sifting through all of that visual information. But what's even more amazing is what's happening to the rest of your body while that's going on, because your whole physiology changes. In particular, your stress levels plummet by up to 60%, which is an enormous amount. So we're using techniques such as MRI to look inside the brain and see what's going on during this stress reduction mechanism. And it's starting to really look like your brain is fundamentally wired to appreciate these natural branched patterns. Now, the initial studies were sponsored by NASA because they want to keep the stress levels of their astronauts down. But, you know, what about the rest of us, right? We want to be relaxed as well, don't we? And in reality, we're not. America spends about $300 billion a year on stress-related illnesses. So what we want to do is work with artists and architects to incorporate these natural stress-reducing patterns into our everyday environments. And I've made a start. I waited until my wife had gone out, and I painted the refrigerator. <laughs> And it, it turned out to be a failed experiment because when she came in and found what I'd done, her stress levels went up, not down. <laughs> but we're still together, and now she does like these uh, natural patterns. And amazingly, these patterns have started to appear in architecture all around the world. So just in like the last five minutes, I've taken you on some quite diverse uh, journeys. And I remember at one point I started to get worried that maybe because of all of this spreading out across the disciplines, maybe I was spreading myself too thin. But then I started to realize that all of these things I was learning in all the different disciplines were actually helping the original projects. So for example, with the implants in the eye, now that we know that the natural eye has this stress reducing mechanism, we have to design the implants so that they don't disrupt that stress reduction. Oops. With the uh, solar panels on the roof, have you ever wondered why solar panels have to look so ugly? And the answer is they don't. We're now designing solar panels so that when you look at them, they actually trigger this stress-reducing mechanism. So if we go back to this map of campus, the thing that really struck me is whatever was driving this interdisciplinary journey, that process was somehow looking after me. Let me show you the sort of uh, the journey itself. These are the uh, meanders around the campus as we, uh, this thing's not working so well, as I go around all of these different departments. I don't know if that, there we go. Ah. <laughs> there we go. Now I think you can kind of see what's happening is that in my interdisciplinary journey, it appears to have traced out a natural pattern. So very similar to the natural patterns that we've been looking at. Now amazingly, people have been studying the journeys that animals move along while they're hunting for food, and they found that those journeys are not random, that they actually trace out natural patterns. So what if it's the same for the rest of us when we're being creative? We're not hunting for food, but we are hint hunting for information and opportunities and ideas. So what if that creative hunt is actually a natural process? And so what we're doing is tracing out a natural pattern. 
Now, that's not to say that we all mindlessly follow the exactly the same natural pattern. And in fact, previous researchers have categorized people into two types, what they call the hedgehogs and the foxes. The hedgehogs are the very, very determined ones where they know exactly where they want to go and they move along straight lines. It's the hedgehogs that kind of spread out searching for opportunities. But they all work together in this natural process. So for example, the foxes actually pass ideas between the hedgehogs. Oops, I'm out, but that's great. <laughs> so what I want to do is wrap up with this basic idea about, if you look at the last 15 minutes, what have I been talking about? The basic take home message is this, creativity appears to be a natural process. And what that means is that you have to follow your natural interests. That's not to say that it's going to be easy. There's always going to be challenges. But here's the great news. That natural process will look after you. It will help you get to the place that you want to go. All that you've got to do is go with the flow. Go down the river. Don't swim against this natural process. So what it means then is you have to follow your natural interests. You actually owe it yourselves to actually pursue your dreams. And the role of the university should be to help you do exactly that. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.